host for these evenings. And for those of you who might be new to this, you'll see that we have coffee, cookies, just like you would at home at a book club. So please help yourself <laughs> during the course of the evening because we want it to be fun as well as engaging. Our topic tonight is Leaves of Grass and Walt Whitman. And to lead us through the book discussion is Dr. Marianne Noble, who's an associate professor in the Department of Literature. Professor Noble's teaching and her research interests include American literature, cultural studies, and gender studies, with a particular emphasis on the construction of sexuality in 19th century American women's literature. She is the author of The Masochistic Pleasures of Sentimental Literature from Princeton <coughs> in 2000, which won a Choice Outstanding Book Award. And you may not know this, but librarians are the ones who write those choice I do know that. Review. It's a, it's a uh, publication of the American Library Association. Um, she has also recently published articles on Gothic and sentimental literature, and now has a, and has a, a book called Sympathy and the Quest for Genuine Human Contact and Romanticism. But she also has a brand new publication published in 2013 on Emily Dickinson and philosophy. So to lead us through tonight, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you for the invitation. This is great. It's fantastic. Uh, I should uh, say that the book Emily Dickinson Philosophy is a co-edited collection of essays. It's not a whole book of mine. But it is out, and it's cool. All right, so uh, a friend of Walt Whitman's uh, by the name of uh, James R. Newhall, he was a guy that he knew, uh, uh, that he knew from... Um, back when uh, they were both newspaper men to get together before Whitman wrote The Leaves of Grass. Uh, many years later, when Whitman was famous, he was interviewed about Whitman, and he said this. It's hardly likely to be conceded with anything like unanimity that the reviewer who placed Whitman at the head of all American poets, naming Bryant and Longfellow especially, could have so written after mature consideration. Perhaps he was greater than all in the sense that everyone is greater than others in something. But supposing the works of the memory of one of those three, Bryant, Longfellow, and Whitman, were decreed to be blotted out of existence, which would the world vote that it should be? I seriously question whether it would be Bryant <laughs> or Longfellow. <laughs> well, the, the <laughs> Library of Congress series books that shaped America uh, series does only include six poets, and Bryant and Longfellow are not among them. <laughs> so Whitman wanted to shape America, uh, so it's great that he's uh, in a list of books that, that includes that. Uh, he wanted to shape America in a number of ways. He's writing in 1855. It's really, you know, this is like the time that the Civil War is like coming to a crisis, and he is writing with a, a vision of American democracy that he hoped would shape a new way of thinking about the Union. Um, he writes about sexuality uh, as well, uh, arguing for the, um, the sacredness of sexuality and trying to um, undo the idea that sexuality is somehow uh, dirty. Um, but the idea that I'm going to talk about today um, is his idea of the soul, um, which is another uh, attitude that he wanted to, to bring and to, to shape American society around this new idea. Um, and so so he has a different sense of the soul from um, Bryant. I've never used a little laser pointer, but I mean, Bryant <laughs> and Longfellow. Uh, and um, and uh, so we're, I'm going to show you that. So some of the things that he says is, I am the poet of the body, and I am the poet of the soul. Why should I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God each hour of the 24, and each moment then. In the faces of men and women, I see God and in my own face in the glass. I find letters from God dropped in the street, and every one is signed by God's name. I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I have said that the body is not more than the soul. And nothing, not God, is greater to one than oneself is. And whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral dressed in his shroud. And there is no object so soft, but it makes a hub for the wheeled universe. And, O oh, my body, I dare not desert the likes of you and other men and women, nor the likes of the parts of you. I believe the likes of you are to stand or fall with the likes of the soul, and that they are the soul. I believe the likes of you shall stand or fall with my poems, and that they are my poems. 
Um, so, so to communicate what the, these ideas of the unity of the body and the soul, and just how radical those are, and how how he hoped that's the way that he wanted to shape an America of the future um, through this new idea of the body and the soul and their unity. I think that we can understand that idea more clearly if we contrast it first with a prevailing idea um, of the soul um, and, and, and so that we can see how different it is um, from, from Whitman's idea. Um, and so I wanna, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk you through um, a poem by Bryant um, written in 1821. Right, one of the great immortals who actually didn't make it, <laughs> um, and you know, and I kind of want to suggest that maybe he doesn't make it, maybe partly because he doesn't have this amazing idea of the soul. Right, at least we can we can entertain that idea. Um, so Bryant uh, is an he's a romantic writer, and he's, so he's an inheritor of the Calvinist idea of the body and the soul. And basically, the Calvinist idea is that the body and the soul are very different. Right, the body is sort of the site of corruption. It's the thing that it's the enemy of the soul basically, and sort of the goal of life is to um, keep your soul as uncorrupted as long as you can. Um, and hopefully if you do it well enough, you'll go to heaven where you will no longer be tormented by body. So that's not, that's not Bryant's idea, but Bryant inherits this, still this idea of the difference between the body and the soul, that they're qualitatively separate from one another. But because he's a romantic, uh, he, there's, a, there's a way, of, he's turning to nature um, as a way of understanding the soul, right? And so, let me just see how I wrote it here. Um, so the, the Romantics rejected the idea that the world is a trying ground full of temptations. Instead, they stressed that nature is pure, a kind of book through which God communicates his spiritual ideas to us. They have a different attitude towards nature from the Calvinists, but they still retain a, str a strong distinction of the difference between the body and the soul. So, um, so to a waterfowl by Bryant. Whither midst falling dew, while glow the heavens with the last steps of day, far through their rosy depths, dost thou pursue thy solitary way? It's a waterfowl, but to me it's always a duck. <laughs> um, right, so the speaker is observing a lone duck uh, flying. And he says, where are you going? Why are, you know, why are you, what are you up to in, in your solitary flight? And then um, I'm skipping, I'm gonna summarize a little bit. He's, you know, he says, are you lost? And um, Actually, first he says, um, you know, you might be in danger. A hunter might see you and, and fire upon you. And, uh, and then he says, you know, what are, what are you doing? Are you lost? And then he says, no, no, no. There is a power whose care teaches thy way along that pathless coast, the desert and illimitable air, lone wandering, but not lost. Uh, so the power that is guiding this duck, might, he might be referring to migration. Right? There's something inside you that helps you to know the right way to go. Um, but there's also a sense that, that this is an allegory for our lives. Right? So the power that teaches the duck is, is kind of an allegory for God. Right? Or you know, something that is, you know, the words like teaches suggests a, um, a more human-centered way of thinking. And this idea of lone wandering but not lost is also an allegory for us, in that in some way we too are lone wandering um, but, but not lost, we're guided. There's a power that's instructing us. And then he thinks, soon that toil shall end, that, that flying. Soon shalt thou find a summer home and rest and scream among thy fellows. Reeds shall bend soon o'er thy sheltered nest. Right, so the duck will make it up north to its summer, summer place and it'll be among its fellows um, and living in this sheltered nest. And again, I think we feel the allegorical message here, which is that we too will make it to our own summer home, um, which I understand to be something like heaven, right? Retirement. Retirement. <laughs> exactly, the golden home, <laughs> a sheltered nest, yeah, right. And um, so, so there, you know, so he sort of sees the happy end point of this migratory flight, and then. Um, then he muses, you know, you're gone, but the lesson that you have imprinted remains deep in my heart. He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone will lead my steps aright. Right, so just as you're being guided by something inside of you that you are trusting and it's taking you to the place you need to be, uh, I can, I also will be the same. And, um, 
what I, I, what, what I want to emphasize is that there's a strong difference here between body and soul. So the body of the bird, this, this bird that's flying, is important because it has a spiritual message, right? It's that sort of metaphysical um, allegory. And so the goal is to look through the bird, right? You know, if the bird is spiritual or, or you know, if it's important, it's the, it's the spiritual idea that matters and not, in fact, the materiality of the bird, right? So, so, there's, so what matters, what's actually real and important, um, is spiritual messages, and God is communicating those. Um, through the through it, um, so our souls are what really matter, and the material world is God's way of teaching us about that. Um, so, um, so in general, uh, the the kind of idea that we see here um, is is romanticism, and uh, it gets developed by Emerson um, in Nature uh, into a more fully articulated sense of the distinction between the body and the soul. Um, so Emerson, <laughs> so Emerson writes that the despotism of the senses binds us to nature as if we were, were a part of it, right? So as if we were a part of it, you know, indicates that we're not. We're not actually, you know, our, our true selves are not natural, are not corporeal. Oops, didn't mean to go there. Our true selves are. Um, separate, right? It's the soul, really. And it's the despotism of the senses that make us think that we're natural. But he says the first effort of thought releases that despotism and relaxes us from that sense of materiality um, of the soul. And so then we can then, and then once we sort of go through that thought, he says, outlines and surfaces become transparent and are no longer seen. Causes and spirits are seen through them. The best moments of life are these delicious awakenings of the higher powers and the reverential withdrawing of nature before it's God, right? So the best moments are when we no longer see what's in front of us, but manage to somehow intuitively see um, the transcendent reality, which is um, what's really real. And um, so there's a disparagement of the body and the sort of, um, of nature itself. Only, the only interest lies in its being a vehicle towards um, higher truth. So I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we might think about an oak tree. What would Emerson say about an oak tree? You know, and I think that he might look at it and say, you know, if, if the oak tree becomes transparent in that way, what we would see instead through it is strength. I'm kind of brainstorming slow and steady growth towards heaven. Maybe it's the fulfillment of the promise in acorns regular and orderly beauty, the possibility for large accomplishment in seemingly small human beings, right? So those, that's the, I think that's my understanding of what he means when he says that think the outlines of things become transparent and we see this kind of spiritual truth. And I really want to stress this because I think that it would be very, it's very different for Whitman. Now, Whitman's sense of like the spirituality of nature um, and the importance of nature is really involves the tree itself. Right? So instead of looking through it, he might see um, you know, a manifold of leaves, an interaction with air, sunshine that might be there, the way that it's making shadows on the ground, uh, the, all the things that come together to make, to make the tree, the miracle <laughs> maybe of you know, the, the human and the, and the tree, like the miracle of, of this kind of growth. Um, but focusing on the tree itself, uh, the actuality of it, and not the spirit, not the uh, the higher truth, right? So this is right. I think I'm, that's good. Um, so um, <clears throat> so what I want to do now is I'm going to ta talk about a passage from this poem called "Starting from Palmanac." Palmanac is an Indian name for Long Island, and it's where he's from. And so it's sort of a he originates from Palmanac. Um, and this is a passage that, um, that, I, that it's all about the body and the soul, um, this topic. And it's always perplexed me. And I have really wanted to like, unravel it and, uh, and crack it. And I, I must confess that I have not fully achieved that ambition. So you're going to watch me like, imperfectly interpret this poem in front of you. But I've tried, and, I, and it's hard. And maybe you can um, help me out with it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read the whole passage. It's two slides like this. And then I'm going to go back and, and break it up into little pieces and talk about them sequentially and what they think uh, they're about. So Whitman says, this is like sections 13 and 14 in this poem. He says, I will not make poems with reference to parts, but I will make poems, songs, thoughts, 
with reference to ensemble. And I will not sing with reference to a day, but with reference to all days. And I will not make a poem, nor the least part of a poem, but has reference to the soul. Because having looked at the objects of the universe, I find there is no one nor any particle of one, but has reference to the soul. Was somebody asking to see the soul? See your own shape and countenance, persons, substances, beasts, the trees, the running rivers, the rocks and sands. All hold spiritual joys and afterwards loosen them. How can the real body ever die and be buried? Of your real body and any man's or woman's real body, item for item, it will elude the hands of the corpse cleaners and pass to fitting spheres, carrying what has accrued to it from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Not the types set up by the printer return their impression, the meaning, the main concern, any more than a man's substance in life or a woman's substance in life return in the body and the soul, indifferently, before death and after death. Behold, the body includes and is the meaning, the main concern, and includes and is the soul. Whoever you are, how superb and how divine is your body or any part of it. Okay, so it starts with this. I will not make poems with reference to parts, but I will make poems, songs, thoughts with reference to ensemble. And I will not sing with reference to a day, but with reference to all days. And I will not make a poem, nor the least part of a poem, but has reference to the soul. Because having looked at the objects of the universe, I find there is no one nor any particle, but that has reference to the soul. <clears throat> so, he's saying that all objects of the universe have reference to the soul. So writing about a poem about objects is always writing a poem about the soul. But um, it seems to me that, that the issue is really one of orientation. Um, what you're always writing about the soul, Whitman says, but it depends on your attitude. Uh, if you write about parts, you're not really writing about the soul. If you're writing about things in a way that makes reference to the ensemble, then you're writing about the soul, right? So it depends on how you want to write about this. If you, th if you contemplate this you know, in reference to the ensemble, right, then, then you're thinking about, you're contemplating the soul, the, the soul quality of the thing that it is. So all things for him um, can be viewed as having this quality of soul. Um, they all have it, and it depends on the orientation. Um, and I think that Bryant and Emerson might be writing about parts, right? They might be ones who are separating things from one another and saying this is soul and this isn't. Um, and, uh, and so he's breaking up, breaking down that sense of the separateness of things. So he says that the soul is both the aggregate that is formed by the sum, the sum total of the things in the universe, and it's also the soul is the glue that holds things together. Um, so the soul is both an ensemble maker and is itself the ensemble, right? The totality of things is the soul, and, 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 what, and the fact of their coming together, their adhesion, um, is also soul. Um, as I was preparing for this talk, I read a, a really interesting article about um, one of Whitman's followers named Maurice Buck, who published a book building on Whitman's spiritual ideas, and he calls it Cosmic Consciousness. That's the title of the book. And I think that that's a pretty good phrase for articulating what I'm, what I'm saying about the soul here, that, that sense of, um, of cosmic totality that's formed by each part in the universe. Uh, by looking at each thing as a necessary component of the totality, we see how it is infused with soul and actually is the soul. So then he goes on, was somebody asking to see the soul? And this is a joke, right? I mean, you know, yes, in fact, we are. This notion is funny because the soul is a vexed and troubling idea. It's the real thing, right? It's the only thing that matters, true value. And yet, we've never seen it, and we're not even sure it exists. So, in fact, yes, one would very much, very, very much like to see the soul. It's kind of a joke to ask it. Um, and uh, we're dying to see it. Uh, if we, would con we, we could see it, we wouldn't be so confused. Whitman does not pull the curtain away from the all-desired phenomenon. He said there is no curtain. There is no barrier hiding the soul from view. You have misunderstood the soul. Right? So it's a question of rethinking what you mean by that rather than trying to find it. Again, it's the cosmic totality that's created by the material world. It is not seen through analogy to our shape and substance, through analogy to ducks or oak trees. It is our shape and substance. Well, we might find this idea of the soul disappointing. <laughs> you know, it's like, really? 
<laughs> just my daily activities, just shopping, sitting in traffic, typing email. These are all there is, and that's soul. There's no higher purpose or meaning. And, um, and I think that, and, and if not, then this philosophy seems to strip my life of whatever dignity I have managed to find in it. <laughs> and in fact, this was an accusation that was routinely leveled at Whitman. He was accused of brute materialism, commonly said that he's like no higher than the beasts. Um, he's only an animal. And he's strapped, but Whitman countered. He, you know, he felt very strongly about this. There's more meaning and value in his conception of the soul than people have understood. More spirituality in physical reality itself than people realize. We do not need to look past physical reality to its spiritual meaning, but find that meaning in the thing itself. So then he goes on. Um, all hold spiritual joys and afterward loosen them. Uh, I'll just talk about that for a second. In the idea that all things hold spiritual joys, we get the sense that the things of the universe, the trees, the rocks, the rivers, the sands, hold spiritual joys, which they loosen when they die. I'm really not sure, but I think that he might have, have in mind something like what Heidegger does when he talks about being. Um, that all of these things have being, and they're part of being. Right? That, they, we, that they, all these things participate in the totality that, that is. Right, so I mean, Heidegger sort of stresses, you know, it's like miraculous that anything exists at all, right? But you know, right from the beginning of four billion years ago, there has been being, and it's always been being, and we're participating um, in this ongoing thing. Right now, we are making being, and um, and then our part will be done, but the being will go on, and yet we still participate in that eternal sense of being. Um, because through our part in it, right? And, um, and also, our own being is enlarged by viewing it that way, by thinking of it in the context of this ongoing process of the, of the being of being. Um, so, you know, that, but that, he might not mean that. <laughs> um, so, when it, so when a living thing dies, I'm still on the first line. Um, when a living thing dies, its body, it, you know, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going on, actually. So then he goes on. How can the real, I, real body ever die and be buried? Of your real body and any man's or any woman's real body, item for item, it will elude the hands of the corpse cleaners and pass to fitting spheres, carrying what has accrued to it, to it from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Okay, this is one of the passages that I'm not sure I have really cracked. Um, I, I'm troubled and confused, actually, by this idea. It's kind of like, oh yes, oh yes, immortality of the body, um, but your real body. <laughs> you know, there's there's the other part. It's like, now it's like there's two bodies, of your real body, or any man's woman's real body. It will elude the corpse cleaners. It feels confusing. <laughs> I, I I don't have a full answer to that confusion. It's if he's talking about a kind of immortality, of the body. What does he mean, you know, why the real body as opposed to the body body? And I thought the body was the real. So I, I feel a distinction creeping in here. Um, I want to contemplate this distinction by comparing it to what it reminded me of, um, which is uh, Paul uh, writing in Corinthians 1. So he's responding, so the Bible, right? <laughs> So, you know, he's responding to some one of his followers or friends who asks him, with what kind of body do they come? And he's talking about the resurrection, right? The idea is that there's this bodily resurrection, not just spiritual, actual bodily resurrection. This is the promise that they're discussing, which they believe in. And so they're like, but which kind of body? And Paul says, just as there are different kinds of flesh, flesh of people, flesh of birds, and flesh of fish, so there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. <clears throat> so Paul is saying, yes, our immortality is of the body but it's a spiritual body. Um, and to our minds, I think this makes no sense, um, since a spiritual body, um, as, a, as the answer to the problem of the natural body, just 
sort of keeps the problem. It's still mind and it's sort of body and spirit, but now it's a spiritual body and it's, it's confusing. Um, uh, since what we're asking is if there's bodily resurrection, as in, do our physical material bodies stick with us? And will it be us, right? Or some kind of like, is it us? And I, I think that's what's at stake in asking that. And he's like, yes, yes, it's us, but a spiritual body. Um, so this is similar to Whitman, I think, so, you know, talking about this idea of the real body. He says, how can the real body die and be buried? And we think, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean, how can it die and be buried? It happens every day. How can it not happen? Right? How, can we not, how can we not die and be buried? So we're very accustomed to thinking in dualistic terms. I, I don't think that Paul is trying to break it down here. I, I think that you know, my sense is that he's really retaining uh, you know, a strong distinction between body and spirit, particularly in phrases like the idea that you know, the, the natural body is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. So there's a, a real sense of the corruption of the natural body here, right? It's weak um, um, and uh, perish well, perishable, right? But so there, you know, I don't think that he's trying to do what Whitman is doing by, you know, by sort of having a spiritual body. Um, yeah. Um, are we just, I, I actually need, need to leave that a little ambiguous too. But let me um, continue with Whitman's theory. Oh, so um, what an important distinction that I see between Whitman's discussion of this and Paul's um, is this idea. Caring what has accrued to it from the moment of birth to the moment of death. And that's um, something that I think Paul is not talking about at all. Whitman is talking about the building of the soul through the materiality of being. Right? So how do we build a soul? I mean, or what is a soul? It's the sum total of our engagements in the world. So that, um, uh, so that we, you know, we go out and we, uh, we you know, go to work or encounter the materiality of the world. And each thing builds us as we are and um, is soul making. And he says it much better than I just did. So let me show you that. So a poem he wrote about the same time as the Leaves of Grass, um, um, Song of Myself, was um, there was a song, this one, it's, uh, there was a child went forth. So the poem goes like this. There was a child went forth every day, and the first object he looked upon and received with wonder, pity, love, or dread, that object he became. And that object became part of him for the day, or a certain part of the day, or for many years, or stretching cycles of years. The early lilacs became part of this child, and grass, and white, and red morning glories, and white and red clover, and the song of the Phoebe bird, and the March-born lambs, and the sow's pink faint litter, all became part of him. That's what I think he's talking about in that preceding passage, right? this idea, carrying what is accrued to it from the moment of birth to the moment of death. It's that, it's that spiritual thing, that self that's created through material investments and engagements in the world. Um, they become part of him. Um, as for how, so, so that's, that's the real body, right, which is the soul that's the creation of the body's engagements and investments in the world itself. So how exactly does that thing elude the hands of the corpse cleaners? This is, I'm just have a, a speculation that I'll share with you. I'm not going to claim, I'm not going to discover it through a perfect close reading, but rather more through extrapolation. And it, it goes back, I think, to the Heidegger idea that I was saying, that because each of us um, goes, you know, participates in this ongoing process of being, we make it, right? The future that unfolds from today can only be the product of today. It can't be the product of anything else. Right? So it always originates in the now. And so how could anything that happened today ever be lost? Right? It's always on the continuum of being. It's, it's, it's always present. Right? It's always part of being, the ongoing process of being unfolding. And so, right, so, you know, I mean, anything that happens on any given day is the seed of tomorrow. And so it'll always be present. How, that, that's my idea of what he's talking about. And that, I think, would be, so the real body then makes sense because it's the kind of spiritualized, materialized unity, 
right, that, that he's talking about. But I could be wrong. Um, right, so, so back on this, just repeating. Um, we become the things that we interact with. This is true physically as well as conceptually. Um, so you will never be able to shed the fact of hearing this talk, right? Even if, if it's forgotten, it's still, it, you know, there's still something present in, in that. Um, and um, so I think this is what Whitman means in the idea of the child who went forth. Our ch ourselves are not individualistic, but communal. Communal, intersubjective, excuse me, communal, intersubjective, and always changing, always dynamic, always in process, um, always... Um, <laughs> becoming what they are. Um, <clears throat> so how can there be a self or a soul that is most true when separated from its body? That idea makes no sense. It's impossible to think about that because the soul is only the thing that's created through the body's investments in the material world. Um, so uh, without the world, there can be no soul. The soul is the intersection of engagements with the world as well as the impetus to go and be part of the world. All right, that part makes sense. So we go to this truly enigmatic passage. He goes on. <laughs> Not the types set up by the printer return their impression, the meaning, the main concern, any more than a man's substance in life or a woman's substance in life return in the body and the soul indifferently before death and after death. My notes say, such a weird passage. <laughs> okay, so. Some things I, I understand. He's developing an analogy between the physical objects involved in typesetting, the letters that get organized into words and that transmit meanings in the form of printed pages, and the relationship between the body and the soul. It's not what I think we would expect. So I think the wrong idea <laughs> um, is that the soul is the idea, while the body is the wet printed sheet that communicates that idea. I think what he's saying is that is the idea is that the soul is nothing but an impetus towards physical action and being. Um, so, so for example, the idea that's communicated by this is more than the idea pure. It's the idea to then be made into a newspaper, right? So again, we don't want to separate the idea from its incarnation, right? As a, really what I'm doing actually, for those of you who are familiar, is that it's kind of, I'm kind of an elaborating an idea of phenomenology. So Husserl says that um, there's no consciousness, but always consciousness of things. Um, we can't, there's no mind that is prior to the things it's contemplating, right? The mind is always an engaged thing. And I think that uh, analogously, Whitman is saying that the soul is always an engaged thing. It's an impetus towards engagement in the world. It, it actually, I think, you know, it might be interesting to think of the soul for Whitman as a verb, right? The problem is that we think of it as a thing, an object, a noun, a subject, a place. Can we see it? But maybe the soul is a verb, this sort of like instinct towards in engagement and enactment. So here, the idea that's being communicated is not just an idea that's being communicated. It's an idea of communication, <laughs> right? An idea to, like, to write something, an idea to make something, just as um, we don't... Um, Actually, you know, brain science tells us that we don't reach, for example, if you do a brain scan, if you reach towards an apple or you reach towards, let's say, an empty sheet of paper, your brain will actually be different. The, you know, what, the, the way that it fires up is different because all actions are intentional, right? So it's reaching for apple. It's not reaching for apple, right? The act and its engagement in the world are one um, in some of the, so cool. <laughs> but anyway, I think he's, you know, I think he's doing something like that. So it's this like impetus towards poem making or impetus towards newspaper making, as opposed to the pure idea of the thing that we then communicate. Right? It's, it's an idea towards um, embodiment. Uh, yeah. So how did I write this here? Okay. So um, it does, so the soul does not sit inside lurking and from time to time try to express itself out in the world. Rather, the soul is itself the expression in the world. The soul is an impetus to be, right? It's that sort of instinct that's in us to participate with the ongoing being of being. 
Um, so Emerson and Paul would encourage us to look past the body to the spirit lurking inside of it. Whitman says that's the wrong way to think of the spirit. The spirit is created by bodily actions with other bodies. It's not a static pure thing that we're born with and that we're trying to keep as clean and uncorrupted as possible. It's an impetus of animation, a life force, a principle of dynamism propelling us out into the world, motivating us to do things in it. So uh, one of the things that it causes us to propel, the spirit propels us to do out in the world is have sex. Um, so it is, and so this idea of the spirit is sort of this like propelling us outwards to other things and important other things are other people, right? So this kind of like movement towards connection with others. Um, of course, sex is supposed to be the most unspiritual thing that we do, right? And that's the, um, the Calvinist legacy. Um, it is widely assumed to be the true meaning of the Garden of Eden metaphor Eating, that eating the apple or original sin is frequently understood to be sex. The whole reason that we're understood as fallen beings is because we are sown in corruption, as Paul put it, right? We're made through sex. Um, so the very, even before we're born, we're already fallen um, because sex is so, um, you know, essentially corrupt. But Whitman insisted that sex is sacred and spiritual. The soul is in the body and the meeting of souls happens in sex. So he says, I believe in you, my soul. The other I am must not abase itself to you, and you must not be abased to the other. Loaf with me on the grass. Loose the stop from your throat. And so the you here is um, the soul, I think. But grammatically it is, but it might extend. So he says, loaf with me on the grass. Loose the stop from your throat. Not words, not music or rhyme I want. Not custom or lecture. Not even the best, only the lull I like, the hum of your valved voice. I mind how we lay in June, such a transparent summer morning. You settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you held my feet. Swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and joy and knowledge that pass all the art and argument of the earth. And I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own. And I know that the spirit of God is the brother of my own. And that all the men ever born are also my brothers and the women, my sisters and lovers. And that a Kelson of the creation is love. <clears throat> so, you know, the we, presumably is the speaker and his soul, right? It's this, like he's addressing his soul, loaf with me on the grass. Um, and so he and his soul are together. But the way that he describes the soul union is basically an act of fellatio, <laughs> to use a, you know, a sort of a Latinate word or you know, something kind of like a blowjob, um, <laughs> right? So you um, turned over upon me and part of the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart. I mean, so it's, it's, you know, it's sort of drawing on that imagery of, you know, of that kind of like sexual, sexual act. But of course, I mean, it's, you know, plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart. So it's, um, it's emotional, <laughs> like completely dissolving this thing. I'm so excited. <laughs> Just a second. <laughs> Will you put that back together? For me? <laughs> right so you know so there's this like fantastic rising tension here right it's just um that's okay we're good um oh uh oh wait wrong direction okay i might not get to all of this don't panic um right so there's there's all this like kind of rising tension here and this like, you know, the, the verb like parting the shirt from my bosom of plunging your tongue to my bare stripped heart, right? And this kind of like incredible grasping reach that he has here. And then there's this empty space. And then following this kind of rising action here is this spreading action, um, this kind of like falling action, all right? And um, so he's, he's sort of describing an orgasm here or suggesting one anyway, swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and joy and knowledge that pass all the art and argument of the earth. Right, and so, 
you know, I think you know his point is quite explicit, right? That he we, here we've got this moment of of sexuality, and he's saying this is a soul encounter. This is soul, and it's not corrupt. This is not um, anti-religious. This is not the opposite of spirituality. It is itself spiritual. And to really stress that point, um, he here in this these lines, you know, I don't, to, to my students, to most of my students, these lines are not familiar. But I was raised as an Episcopalian, and uh, these lines are an adaptation of lines that close every Episcopalian service. I heard it every week for the first 15 years of my life. Um, this, the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and so forth. And so you, we can see how blasphemous, how shocking, how utterly scandalous and absolutely inappropriate <laughs> this kind of illusion is here. Um, and this is the kind of thing that made people like, I, I was reading, you know, it was like one guy was talking about walking with Whitman in Washington and a woman passed them and she pulled her skirts to be sure to not to touch him. She said, my God, and he said, oh yes, oh yes. You know, people do that all the time, right? Because he's so dirty. Right? He's such a filthy mind that they can't even be a bear to come into contact with him. You know, and surely it's passages like this that would make people feel that way. Um, right, so if we, but I think that the contrast between the two is actually significant. So the original is from Philippians 4.7. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And Whitman says, swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and joy and knowledge that pass all the art and argument of the earth. So first of all, he says, passeth all understanding, and, but Whitman claims knowledge, right? So this kind of incredible flooding of God's love and peace um, is knowledge. It is understanding, but it passes all the art and argument of the earth. So it's not that we can't understand it. It's that we can't understand it in a logical way, let's say, or claim it in a kind of logocentric way. Um, we can know this, um, the kind of um, spirituality I would say through the body. So for example, at one point, um, just riffing off of this idea, he says, um, he's not riffing, I am. Um, <laughs> he says, um, logic and sermons never convince. The damp of the night drives deeper into my soul. And so it's the body. It's like bodily knowledge, damp of the night is what communicates with the soul. And so you know, this art and the argument of the earth, these are not sufficient, but we know. He says, we know. We don't need to be so troubled about issues like soul and where is it and how much does it weigh and how many angels fit on the head of a pin. Or it's, 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 it's in there. It's in this sort of like bodily experience of going out, of encounter with the other, um, of love, of sex, of the, the full experience of embodiment and all of its myriad forms. Um, so this part here uh, is really an amazing uh, metaphor that I need to explain to you a little bit. Um, so that you can fully understand it. So he says, um, I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own, the spirit of God is the brother of my own, and that a kelson of the creation is love. Um, and this is a kelson. So I copied from Wikipedia. The member, which particularly in a wooden vessel, lies parallel with its keel. So this is the keel down here, right? And it stabilizes the boat and makes sure it doesn't fall over, right? And so it's parallel to the keel. It's running, right, <laughs> that way. Um, but above the transverse members, such as timbers, frames, or floors. So these are the transverse. It's fastened to the keel partly to impart additional longitudinal stiffness, but principally to bind the longitudinal members to the transverse members, right? So the longitudinal ones need to be kept with these, and you put a kelson in the bottom of your boat to hold the parts together. So a kelson of the creation is love. Right? Love is the thing that binds the creation together. Right? All the parts could fall apart. Right? When you, you know, when if you put something in your boat, the parts might just like splay open apart like that and fall apart from one another. So you put a kelson in to keep it all together, to bind the parts together. And that's what love is. That's what love is. Love is the glue. <laughs> right? Or it's like the structural thing that keeps the universe together. How does it do that? because it brings us together, <laughs> right? It, you know, it, it, we, hi, how are you? Good, come together, right? Or sex, we come together. And of course, sex is very important for the ongoing creation of being, 
right? That, that sort of eternal thing. Without that, um, let's say the parts would fall apart. So love is this thing that unites and keeps it all together. Um, my students love that passage. <laughs> Um, uh, and then um, yeah, Emerson, spirituality, where am I? I've lost my page. That's all right. Oh, yeah, right. Um, so uh, <laughs> what I'm going to show you now is a quotation um, written by a great supporter of Whitman's, a, a, a fan, a lover of Whitman, not, not a disciple. His name is um, Sanborn, and he's, he's a regular publisher, a regular author in the Springfield Republican. Um, so he says, Whitman has long been a standing text in the newspapers for such wit as heaven provided us with. He provokes jests by the resolute way in, in which he intrudes, among ideal things, the fleshly and generative forces out of which human life springs, but of which the human soul is reasonably shy. And I was just so fascinated because I feel he gets it so terribly wrong that he's absolutely incapable of grasping the deep irony of what, of what he wrote, you know, what he writes here. Um, you know, they make fun of him for um, intruding ideas um, of, you know, the sex, right, fleshly and generative forces. The, whole, the human soul is reasonably shy um, of sex. And, of course, Whitman's whole point is that, like, that that's a great soul act. Um, and so there's one final point that, I would love to make, and I hope you'll bear with me here. Um, and it's, I know it looks long, but it's not going to be so long. <laughs> um, so he says, souls of men and women, it is not you I call unseen, unheard, untouchable, and untouching. It is not you I go argue pro and con about to settle whether you are alive or no. I own publicly who you are if nobody else owns. We consider Bibles and religion divine. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give the life. It is you who give the life. The sum of all known reverence I add up in you, whoever you are. List close, my scholars dear. Doctrines, politics, and civilization exurge from you. Sculpture and monuments and anything inscribed anywhere are tallied in you. The gist of histories and statistics, as far back as the records reach, is in you this hour, and myths and tales the same. If you were not breathing and walking here, where would they all be? The most renowned poems would be ashes, orations, and plays would be vacuums. And this is the part that I want to think most about. All architecture is what you do to it when you look upon it. Did you think it was in the white or gray stone? or the lines of the arches and cornices. All music is what awakens from you when you are reminded by the instruments. It is not the violins and the cornets. It is not the oboe nor the beating drums. Right, so all things, all, I love the idea that architecture is not in the building, it's in you, right? So what is architecture? It's the appreciation of beauty, or the perception of beauty, or even just the perception of organized construction in something else, right? So any building is just a build, you know, is just a pile of stones. The architecture is in you, right? So without each person as the source of like, I would say not only appreciation but making, right? making the the ensemble, right? Perceiving and like bringing it into being without no perception of the ensemble, in a sense, there is no ensemble, right? So all these things, um, exurge, <laughs> a made up word, a word made up by him, exurge out of each person, right? So because of this, I, I think that, that this idea um, helps us understand um, why Whitman writes the way he does, okay? He has a very odd way of writing. I asked my students, I'm like, Okay, what part of speech do we not see in a Whitman poem? And like, they can't get it. I'm like, look, come on, look, 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 you know, what are the parts of speech? I put them up on the board. There's no adjectives, right? What, we, what Whitman, his, his most famous sort of style look, uh, or, you know, sorry, sort of style thing that he does, it's not the right word, but, you know, is these lists, right? He just names things, right? And he will just like put them in sequence. It's like, why? Why? But it's because all poetry and music and architecture exurges out of you, 
right? So he's going to put the thing in front of you, and you have to make it, right? So here, here's how he put it. In my poems, all concentrates in, radiates from, revolves around myself. I have but one central figure, the general human personality typified in myself. Only I am sure my book inevitably necessitates that its reader transpose him or herself into that central position and become the actor, experience himself or herself of every page, ever, every aspiration, every line. Right? So the idea is that he says, you know, I just put this before you. Right? He's going to put these things before us and say, make it. Right? And he's not going to give us his vision because that would be counter to the whole point of it, right? which is that like, you must make it. And only you can sort of bring into being the soul that is, let's say, incarnated in, in the poem, um, but that was not incarnated in the kind of like spirit into um, something else way, but that was itself the spirit that created the poem. Right? It's not a spirit that then he captured in a poem. It's the spirit of poem making. But the spirit of poem making, the poem that he makes through that spirit is one of inclusion. Read it, identify, participate in the ongoing creation of the leaves of grass. So, there you go. That's it. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't that just like, ah, ah. <laughs> I got that off of the Library of Congress webpage. It's so pretty. <laughs> so I'm sure that was all... <clears throat> perfectly clear. There's really <laughs> no, no no questions remain. <laughs> Are there any questions? Pat. Uh, Pat. Uh, Pat. Uh, Pat. To what extent might Whitman have been exposed to Eastern philosophy and Eastern religions? He and was. They will have, ex have been at the root of his focus on spirit rather than unit or object. Yes. That I, I, he, did, he did read the Bhagavad Gita, and he also encountered it through Emerson and Thoreau and, the, and all the transcendentals who were all quite steeped in all those things. Um, yeah, a strong influence. I actually had a student who wrote a senior thesis on just that, and she had this whole idea about Atman, and really what he's talking about is Atman. So I think that there's, it's a similar mystical vision. Um, yeah. But I think he, I'm not sure that um, he had all of that reading under his belt before the first edition of Leaves of Grass. I'm not, you know, I think that was something that was ongoing. But you, you seem like you have something more to ask well, on that. I'm thinking about the other folks in the Enlightenment period. And perhaps uh, he reflected more deeply the Eastern values than many of them did. Many of them perhaps, I, and again, I don't know the, the group well enough individually to be able to speak to what they contributed and how they thought. But um, of the, the Longfellow and Bryant, the, the ones that you yeah. pulled up here, uh, it, it, perhaps the, the, they were still carrying the, the, the very Protestant, the Calvinistic, Western, individualized foundation into their work, whereas Whitman brought, it seems to me like what you're saying, brought more of the Eastern. I think that that's right. I mean, Emerson, I mean, Emerson was just like struggling always with like the fundamental dualism that he brought to his project and really just had difficulty. He went so far, you know, he's, he went very far in undoing that, but really could never just kind of the opening line of, you know, in the opening of nature, Emerson says, all of, all of existence can be invited, divided into two things, the me and the not me. So first of all, the me is defined through separation from everything, as opposed to connection or inclusion, like there was a child went forth is very different. But then he says, um, in, among, included in the not me is my own body. Right? So then he, so he makes this radical separation, and then the rest of his, almost his, the rest of his entire career is an effort to overcome that distinction, and like to claim his body, to claim others as part of himself. But you know, I mean, in, in, um, uh, in ex 
experience. He says, a sympathetic man is in the position of a drowning swimmer, a, drow a person surrounded by a drowning swimmer. And if you let them hold on to you, they'll just pull you down. Right? So, the, so there's this sense of like a self that's under assault from others in Emerson. And I think that that, I mean, the transcendentalist kind of responded to that. Whitman is different. You know, he really is different. And maybe it is the Eastern, I, I, honestly, I don't, I don't I, I don't know. I, I don't know more about that than what I'm saying. But they did all read it and they loved it. And you know, they talked a lot about, you know, the Hindu, the great Hindu mystical texts. Yeah. Yeah. Whitman and his work were pretty well known at the time. Yeah. Could you say he had any direct political impact? I'm so glad you asked. Could, could you point to My God, I, that I could. Book might have affected actual. Election. That's what I mean by God election. love you, man. Or do you think that he might be able to find an indirect political impact in the way he created a consciousness in the country that made the country different? I'm not pointing to an election or a candidate, but more the way people approach uh, politics. I would say pretty much no. I mean, he wanted to. He really, I mean, that was, he really wanted to have that kind of political impact. Um, he said, um, the proof of my poetry will be when my country has absorbed it as, I think, lovingly as I have absorbed it. Something like that. So he really wanted to be, he, I mean, he wanted to be the bard of America. He wanted, I think he wanted to stop the civil, you know, the coming civil war. I mean, he was really trying to make that change. But, you know, this is not a poetry reading country, you know, and um, I don't think it's, you know, it ever had that kind of political impact. But, in 1857, Abraham Lincoln in his Springfield Law Office picked up a copy of Whitman's poetry volume, Leaves of Grass, began reading it silently, and was so entranced after half an hour that he started over, reading it aloud to his colleagues. Another anecdote originally contained in an 1865 letter by a Lincoln aide had Lincoln gazing out a White House window, spotting the hale, bearded Whitman walking by and exclaiming, well, he looks like a man. <laughs> um, and so this is from David Reynolds. He says they might, these stories might be apocryphal, but they are widely repeated <laughs> by people like me because they're great stories and they haven't been disproven. Um, so with Lincoln, I mean, that's great, right? I mean, it's incredible almost. It's hard to believe it actually happened, you know, but I like to think it did that, you know, Whitman, act I mean, excuse me, Lincoln picked it up and was like, this is it. This, this is what it's all about. Lincoln, you know, not even like, you know, Polk. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> Another? Well, that's, that's amazing. Um, I mean, there are passages in Specimen Days where um, Whitman is walking down the streets of Washington during the Civil War, watching Lincoln come in from the soldier's point, it's now the soldier's home, and with his entourage and, and on a daily basis. And it, it's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. And loved him. He really, you know, before his death, he loved him so much, so him as this great leader. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's incredible, really. No, <laughs> just you, you do it for me. <laughs> so uh, one, what's interesting is that um, Walter White, the main character in the series Breaking Bad, frequently quotes Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass in various poems. And there are a number of selections, some of which you just presented, which then are the theme for the various stories. And it's curious because the character in Breaking Bad is dark and you know it's very evil kind of lapsed professor and lapsed teacher. Deeply tormented. Deeply tormented <laughs> and then here you have this sort of embracing of life and, and soul and the body. What does he do with the passages that he quotes? Are they like his opposite, like the, the beautiful sort of side that he isn't? It's almost like a Greek chorus of, of sort of a narration of what then, what his motivation is or how he observes. And in fact I just wonder whether something like that connection between a popular series today and Whitman of mid-19th century, whether that is a way in which one can also think about this persistence and the 
so um, it would be very interesting to, to review what what you have pointed out as, as this treatment of soul against the backdrop of popular culture, and would it still, what would you think about the way in which his work is now being presented, and is it in fact more right. true? I can hasten to assure you that article is going to be written soon. <laughs> it will not be written by me. I just could not watch past the third or fourth episode. It was, like, it was so violent. It just made me want to throw up. It was like, um, but I regret it because it's amazing and like the greatest, you know, sort of filmic art. I mean, that's 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 great. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean. My, my comments, obviously, since I only got to like three episodes, it was like, you know, he's like, I'm not the po poet of goodness. All I do not decline to be the poet of wickedness, also, and uh, you know, he, he includes all of it. Um, but do you, how did, like, what did it did it like were like were the words sort of relevant to, you know, do you know what I mean? Was it just the fact of Leaves of Grass and poetry, or was it actually the ideas that were in? Well, see, I Well. Are the themes of specific episodes, and hmm. they, they essentially set the stage for what happens in particular episodes. Hmm. And uh, I think uh, I remember Whitman and White <laughs> is revealed as being a drug thinking through a copy of Leaves of Grass that has references to his activities. Wow, wow! I didn't know that's. I, I I'm surprised I didn't know that. I mean, how Whitman is perceived today, and yeah. What what the linkage might be to popular culture? Because many of the ideas that he presents in Leaves of Grass, and I read Leaves of Grass cover to cover when I was a college student, and, and it captured my attention. And that was many years ago. I just wonder what your students now. Well, um, when I was teaching it, Michael, uh, Michael, um, my husband saw that um, some students were posting. What, I'm sorry, what is? I can never remember the name of that website that dissolves like after you post on it. Talking about Nick there? Yeah, right. He saw some students posting, and we think it because you know, it was so right hot on the heels of my teaching it that um, I think it was a you know sort of a commentary posted on Yik Yik. What did they write? What was it again? I mean, it was something just like, I mean, you know, my memory was like, this Whitman stuff is unbelievable. It's amazing. And somebody else was like, yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, so it was really, I mean, how could it not, you know, speak? Well, <laughs> how could anyone fail to love this stuff with their whole heart? I mean, my God. It's obvious. <laughs> no, I, th I mean, you know, it's, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, my job is to make it, to help make it relevant and accessible. And that's what I try to do. <laughs> ah, <thank you. laughs> Anyone else? Mary? Oh, right, okay. Um, no, not really. Um, do you want to, why don't you just, can you say a little bit more about why you see the connection? I mean, 
you know, I mean, really, I'm way out of my comfort zone on this one. But I mean, you know, the I mean, you know, that's the rebirth of the interest in the material, the human, right? Sort of the you know Michelangelo images, like right, the body itself, as opposed to those spiritualized Fra Angelico paintings. So there certainly is that in common. Um, but I, I, you know, the idea of like sort of the soul, the materialization of soul. It doesn't sound very Renaissance to me, you know. I mean, that part, you know, right. I mean, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I connect, I mean, I see connections with Rumi, you know, Rumi, the Persian poet. I mean, there, you know, that's a really strong um, similarity, you know, that, that sense of mysticism. Uh, you know, I've been, the influences that I've been working on are um, Goethe and Herder. Um, he reviewed Goethe's um, autobiography uh, in, um, in the Brooklyn Eagle and, um, and, um, uh, and, you know, sort of waxed eloquent about it. And, you know, um, Goethe has this idea of elective affinities, that all things are drawn to one another and these, like, sort of, like, connections. And so I feel like we can see the sort of the translation of elective affinities into Whitman. Um, and my particular interest is in Herder, who's... Um, Goethe's teacher, um, and I mean, I got interested in Herder because he coined the term empathy, which is something I have been researching. So um, he he invented the idea of Einfühlung, um, which um, uh, yeah, sort of like that idea of feel, knowledge and understanding through feeling yourself into the other. Um, but you know, really, Herder is the one who has this like. I mean, he really. I mean, Goethe got that idea of elective affinities. I'm not going to say directly from Herder, but Herder wrote about it first and was his teacher. You know, so that, that sense of like things coming together. So he talks, and he talks about sex in that way. And he talks about kind of like these pulsations of the universe that come together and how sex is an analogy for it. And that's, that's Whitman. I mean, that's, that's what he does. So um, I, it's known that Whitman read Herder. Um, and so that's something that I've been exploring. But yeah. Often misinterpreted as living for pleasure and pursuit of pleasure. It was a, a Greek idea. Oh, hedonism? Thank you. But if you look at the real meaning of hedonism, it isn't just living for pleasure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and Jefferson writes about that? Jefferson said, I think in some very private way, I'm happy with this. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, yeah. Right. I mean, I, you know, I love the line, um, loose the stop from your throat, you know, lie with me on the grass, you know, and I just love, you know, I don't want, you know, music, nor rhyme, nor even your best. I love that. I don't even want your best. Just the hum of your velvet voice. And that's, you know, that's kind, that's kind of hedonism. It's like, it's just like ease up. Just like, you know, you don't have to work so hard, right? I, I say that to my students. I like, you know, I, I try to say that comfortingly to my students. You know, sometimes I want your best, but it's like, just like it's relaxing. I don't need your best. Right? You don't have to give me your best. Just, you know, just being is just fine. Right? So that's a kind of um, kind of hedonism. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's why I made the association because I mean, he has a lot of interest in health. He's like very healthy. Yeah. <laughs> Cool, great, that's interesting. A capacious mind, yes. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, are, are you still anything of an Episcopalian? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, it's a private question. <laughs> um, uh, we've been attending a Methodist church for um, a long time, uh, but I sometimes I feel like, a, an, like, a, like um, I'm cheating on my first and truest um, marriage. So I kind of feel like one in my in my heart, but honestly, Methodism is working pretty well right now. But why do you ask? Well, you gave it as the basis of your youth. I just wonder how. 
Um, yeah, you know, a lot of it has stuck with me, um, but, you know, my, I mean, I don't really, you know, I mean, my sense is that it, my experience of Episcopalianism was that it was very much about, like, you and your, your sort of challenges of faith, and uh, the current church that we attend seems to be more about a, an outward focus, you know, spirituality is more about turning outward and less about, like, reconcile, you know, trying hard to believe things that make no sense, it, you know. That was sort of my experience with the Episcopalian Church, <laughs> though I um, but you know obviously it sank in and and I loved it, yeah. But do, I mean, do you have any like further reasons for you know are you? No, I just uh, I'm an Episcopalian and I I experienced some of the same things as a youth from the church. I just wondered where we yeah. still have it. Yeah, yeah, and another and another wandering. It could it was not a deliberate, resolute turning away. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that regard, you use it in your analogies and in your explanation, your critical analysis of Whitman right. for comparative purposes. And I wonder if we were, if you were to go back even further than, than Paul, for example, and go back to Ruth, for example, and look at some of that, that Persian so deep and so uh, and permeates still the Eastern culture and the and the Persian culture, and to see if what the bridges might be between the two. I, said, I think I thought Rumi was like 12th or 13th century. It's not pre-Paul. 13th century. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I I love I love Rumi. Rumi's great. I mean, I don't, I don't feel like I need it for scholarly purposes because there's nothing except um, unity of mysticism. I mean, they describe very similar experiences. Yeah. Yep. I always want to, you know, I, I feel like this talk really should end. I wish I had thought to end it this way. It would be, um, you know, doing, having Louis Armstrong singing, you know, I see clouds of blue. <laughs> or skies of blue, clouds of white. Uh, you know that, like I see babies, and they'll learn. They'll know much more than I've ever known. And I think to myself, "What a wonderful world." That's what he's writing, I think. Yeah. Um, first of all, the article is not in the MLA yet, so somebody can write that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, uh, you don't give yourself enough credit. We, I think we all just. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you.